Welcome to the Better Than Cash Alliance webinar on making digital payments safe for all, which is based on our recently released Responsible Digital Payments Guidelines. I'm Ruth goodwin Groen, the Managing Director of the Better Than Cash Alliance, and I'll be your moderator today. And I can't tell you how happy I am that you're all with us. We have people from all over the world, and we'll be going to a poll in just a minute to, so that you can see where everybody's from. First, let me just give you our hashtag, because we'll be live tweeting from the Better Than Cash account, and you can share your opinions on Twitter as well if you want to. It's hashtag cash2, as in the number two, digital, cash to digital. So please feel free to use that. We have a brilliant panel today, and I'm sure that you're all really excited about hearing from them. So let's go to the first poll to see where everybody's from so you can be part of this global webinar. In front of you, you can see five regions, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific, Latin America and the Caribbean, North America, Europe, or global. Please, can you click on one, which is the region where you primarily work, not your headquarters. So if you can click on that, we'll give you 10 seconds to click on it, and then we'll see the poll coming up. So pick a region where you primarily work, and, uh, and then it will come up for everybody to see. Okay, I think we're good. Let's see where everybody's from. Oh, that's wonderful. We have lots of participants from Africa, Asia, lots from North America, Europe, and global. Wow, what a great diversity of participants uh, on the call today. So welcome to all of you, wherever you are in the world. Our next poll is the sector that you work in, so you can see where everybody is. And that poll will identify where, whether you work for a government in any form of the private sector, international development organization, academia, or other. Again, we'll give you 10 seconds to choose one, and we'll see where everybody's from. So we've got a great diversity of regions, and I'm sure we'll have uh, some diversity in industries. So if you could finish selecting, we'll go to see where everybody's from. Thank you. We have lots of people who work in international development, which is uh, hardly surprising, but what is absolutely terrific is so many from the private sector and uh, other. We'll love to figure out where you're all from, and we'll obviously uh, be checking our uh, participant list. But that's great news that, that we've got such a great cross-section of people. So let me go ahead and introduce our uh, the Better Than Cash Alliance just quickly. For those of you who don't know, it's a partnership of governments, companies, and international organizations that accelerates the transition from cash to digital payments to reduce poverty and drive inclusive growth. We do three things. We advocate for the transition from cash to digital payments in a way that advances financial inclusion and re promotes responsible digital finance, which is why we're here today. We conduct research and we catalyze the development of inclusive digital payments ecosystems in our member countries. One thing I do want to say is that we're agnostic about channels. It's, we work with our members as what's appropriate in each market. We're global, so it's gonna be a big difference uh, whether what's appropriate, whether it's banks or mobile phone accounts or cards of all types or online or a combination of all of those. Uh, we're agnostic as to what's better. It just depends on the market. So the panelists today are innovators in this market who are really looking to see how to best serve clients. First, I'd like to introduce Mador Diora, who's the Chief Financial Officer of Paytm in India. He's also Senior Vice President and is responsible for leading Paytm's finance function, investments, and fundraising activities. We all know that Paytm has had tremendous growth in India in the past few months. And uh, I know many of you are very keen to, to hear from him. Welcome, Madhur. Ruan Swanepoel is the head of mobile financial services at Tigo in Tanzania. And he leads innovation, great to have that title, Ruan, development and support of mobile payments and mobile money products and services. For those of us who are uh, across innovations in financial inclusion, uh, know Tigo's work, and we look forward to hearing from you, Rowan. 
Elias Vargas is the head of operational risk supervision at the uh, SBS in Peru. Peru was a founding member of the Better Than Cash Alliance, and so we're delighted that uh, Elias is with us today. He was involved in developing the regulations in Peru related to operational risk and electronic payments, and he's an expert in regulatory compliance and risk management. So we're delighted that you're with us today. Last but not least is uh, Ros Grady, who's uh, much sought after uh, international expert on regulatory frameworks and specifically on digital financial inclusion and consumer protection. And Ros worked with us to help develop the guidelines. I know it's very late in Australia, so we're, we're really glad you're able to join us, Ros. So I'm going to uh, start with you to give us an overview of the eight responsible digital payment guidelines and some background on how they were developed. Over to you, Roz. Okay. Thank you very much, Ruth. I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to be able to talk about the guidelines. Um, they, By way of background, they reflect several years of consultations about the nature and importance of responsible digital payments. There were discussions between regulators, payment service providers and makers, and international development agencies, with the Alliance taking a lead role in those discussions. They also integrate a wide range of other global principles, standards and codes, as well as related research and reports. So there's a lot of thinking and learning um, that's gone into the guidelines. Our overall aim was to identify what underserved clients might reasonably expect from a responsible digital payments market, taking into account the very well document, documented risks in these markets. Markets. These risks are, of course, especially acute for financially excluded and underserved clients, especially where they have low levels of technological capability. And addressing them is good for both clients and industry. So what do the guidelines say? Let me start, obviously, with guideline one. This is the overarching principle of treating clients fairly. Essentially, the overall relationship with clients needs to be a fair one if they're going to trust and actually use digital payments. Examples of treating them fairly include simple and clear advertising and contract terms, balanced terms and conditions which do not take unfair advantage of clients, no unfair discrimination, compensation for unauthorised transactions that occur after a provider has been notified of, for example, a lost or stolen, stolen card. And another example, the final one, is processing a payment made in a power outage as soon as possible after it ends. There's many examples around the world of these, of how clients are treated fairly, both in, the, in regulation and in the private sector. One particular example is in Indonesia. It's the regulation on consumer protection for payment systems. They prescribe prohibited standard clauses and provide examples of those sorts of clauses, which include unilateral change clauses, in other words, cha changes that only a provider can make, and clauses which limit the provider's liability. So that's guideline one. Moving on to guideline two, Keep client funds safe. Arguably, the most fundamental concern of any digital payments client is that they're going to be able to access their funds as and when needed. Clients feel there is a risk their money is somehow not on their phone or card or in their account. And in some markets, history gives them a good reason to worry. So how can we make sure this will not happen? The examples in the guidelines include providers holding one-to-one -one funds matching out outstanding account balances in, for example, a trust account or perhaps in government securities. Another example is having robust, safe and secure systems and importantly, well-designed, simple user interfaces which minimise the risk of mistaken and unauthorised transactions. And of course, providers taking responsibility for fraud by employees and agents and for reasonably preventable security breaches. So that's Rod, a that's, uh, thanks, Roz. Keeping clients' funds safe is 
Absolutely critical. And uh, the superintendencia in Peru has recognized this risk and really wants to keep its clients' funds safe. And Elias, you are going to be telling us about what you've done uh, at SBS, but you wanted to first talk about how this fits into the context of the digital financial inclusion work of SBSS. So can you just give us some quick background to help us understand where you're coming from? Of course, Ruth, thank you. As part of its broader mission to ensure the stability, solvency, and transparency of the financial sector here in Peru, SBS tries to bring more, more Peruvians into the financial system safely and securely. As regulators, uh, we contributed in the development of an electronic money regulatory framework in 2013, and also we helped launch the National Financial Inclusion Strategy in 2015. In the first case, we designed it to strike a balance between innovation and risk management. It also encouraged a level playing field by allowing the participation of traditional financial institutions, as well as new firms specializing in issuing e-money. One important outcome of it was that consumers have greater choice of services and providers, and at the same time, the system can reach more users, particularly the unserved and underbanked. From the National Financial Inclusion Strategy perspective, uh, the objective of it was promoting the development of digital channels and instruments for retail payments. We believe that the digital channels have the advantage of reaching more Peruvians at lower cost and thus contribute to our broader financial inclusion aims. That's great. There's a very clear overarching framework there. So how have you specifically addressed the issue of uh, keeping clients funds safe then? Yeah, to, to combat the risk you, uh, you just mentioned, the risk that exists in these kind of models, the regulatory framework in Peru established some conditions for the functioning of e-money model. First of all, it has to use an electronic money account, which is very different from a traditional debt deposit account. For example, uh, opening this kind of account is much simpler. There are operational limits to reduce fraud and money laundering risks. Financial intermediation is not permitted, and the trust, a trust account is needed, which is, has to be equivalent to the 100% of the money issued. The funds in, in this trust are independent, an independent asset, and the only beneficiaries are the electronic fund clients. In that way, we, uh, we are trying to eliminate the risk that the trust manager could be affected by liquidity or solvency problems. While the funds can be invested to avoid losing value, it is possible only in deposits of financial institutions with a high credit rating, in treasury bonds, or in instruments issued by Peru's central bank only. SBS ensures compliance of all these matters by monitoring the issuing companies through on-site and off-site supervision. One example is the case of Modelo Peru, uh, where the requirement, requirements must be meet, met by each of the participant issuers, rather than the system administrator. Yes, we know and uh, love Modelo Peru. Uh, just quickly then, is there anything on the operational risk side that you just wanted to share with us? Yeah, and, and last but not least, client funds are also exposed to operational risks, you know, such as fraud, theft, operation processing errors, computer system failures, among others. If these uh, risks materialize, they obviously could generate losses for the client. So this is also a, a worry for, for us as regulators. To mitigate the, this kind of risk, of risk, SBS has established that the norms associated with operational risk management which are applicable to banking models, are also applicable to electronic funds. And it includes also norms related to information security systems and business continuity.
Great. Well, I'm sure that uh, if I was a client in Peru, I would be very glad to know that uh, you were there making sure that m that my money was safe. So uh, that's uh, really great. Of course, this is uh, what you've worked out in Peru. Other uh, jurisdictions will have a slightly different approaches, but all of them will be looking at how to keep uh, client funds safe. So, Rose, let me go back to you. We're up to guideline three, ensuring product transparency for clients. Okay, so ensuring product transparency for clients, the sorts of risks we're dealing about dealing with here um, include clients being confused about the terms of a payments product, how it operates in practice, being charged undisclosed fees, and not understanding what to do if there is a mistaken or unauthorised transaction. And the ultimate risk the guideline covers is that clients may try but then not use a product because they don't understand it. Guideline 3 gives us examples of how to deal with these transparency risks. They include providing a clear, easy to understand, simple, comparable statement of the product features and the terms on which the product is provided and providing this statement before the client acquires the service. Another example of transparency is providing access to transaction receipts and account records. All this information, of course, needs to be kept up to date and the client should be able to access the information over time, including digitally. Of course, the question still remains, how do you achieve transparency in the digital age, especially on a simple feature phone with a tiny screen? For terms and conditions which might run to four or five pages in small print for an e-money account. Yes, and I think we've got someone who can answer that question, Ros <laughs> Mador. Paytm uh, has, uh, has worked on this issue, so perhaps you could give some examples of how you've addressed uh, transparency. Sure, thanks, Ruth. Um, so we have found that product transparency is absolutely critical uh, for first-time users of digital accounts. Remember, in India, we're dealing with um, customers who, have, who may have never used a digital transaction app before. Uh, for any use case. Uh, so just to give you an example, one of the hardest things that we found uh, to develop in an app environment here in India, given the basic connectivity that a lot of our users have and, uh, and relatively low-end smartphones in general, uh, is the passbook feature. Uh, this is a feature where customers can go and look at all their transaction history. Uh, enabling that sort of uh, feature for uh, dozens if not hundreds of transactions in real time, literally we're talking microseconds. That is actually quite a big technology challenge here in India, but we actually threw a lot of resources because we felt that the transparency and the control uh, that people will, uh, that people, people will feel if they have all their records available to them in real time will really make a difference. Um, so, uh, if, if you don't have that in real time, that, it, that, that moment before, after you feel like you've done the transaction but it's not updated, uh, actually is a moment of anxiety, and we want to minimize uh, that that time. The second thing that we have done is uh, we know that a lot of our users uh, may not be able to access the passport feature or may not be comfortable doing that. Um, so we actually send SMSs for most transactions, uh, especially if we see that uh, there's that behavior that you don't go to passport very often. Now that costs a lot of money for us to use the traditional telecom networks uh, to send SMSs, but we think that it's absolutely worth it. Uh, for the comfort and security that customers feel. These are just a couple of examples uh, of how we, uh, w what we prioritize uh, for to, to ensure that customers feel that they have uh, transparency in their payment transactions. Thanks. I think that moment of anxiety that you talked about when you wonder whether transactions have gone through and then that assurance when you either see the results confirmed either on an SMS or in the passbook feature I think is hugely important. So uh, glad to hear that that's important for you in terms of uh, working with your clients. But the product transparency, what I'm hearing you saying is very closely related to the next guideline of designing for client needs and capabilities. So I'm going to come back to you on the next one. Rose, do you just want to give us a quick overview first? Sure. So guideline four highlights the increased new emphasis on the need for payments products to be actually designed with a client in mind, so the client at the center. 
it's increasingly recognised that it's only if clients' needs, preferences and behaviour are reflected in the design of these products will we see increased usage and understanding and of course less complaints. Um, how do you do this? It can be done through the traditional ways of client-oriented research, focus groups and surveys, but also the use of a vast array of customer data. This is the world of big data which we'll come back to, I know. So backing up the emphasis on product design, the guideline recognises the need for clients to be advised as to how to use a payment service, so help them understand how to use it and operate it, and how to safeguard security credentials such as PINs. There's also recognition of the usefulness of, for example, a 24-hour call line for users, um, as well as special support for first-time users. Clearly, this has to be adapted for each market, uh, where for clients in each market or subsection of the market. So, Madur, it sounds intuitive to figure out what clients need and design for it, but it's not as easy as it sounds. Uh, but you've experienced tremendous growth. So, how have you integrated designing for clients' need and capability in in your products? Uh, absolutely, uh, and this is uh, actually quite something that we're quite proud of because a lot of these things have to be designed, as was mentioned earlier, for challenges in your home environment. You, these are not things that you can copy and paste from other markets. Uh, so the backdrop of India is uh, some of the challenges and uh, themes that we see uh, that form the bedrock of this, uh, when we think about what designs we need to do. Uh, so obviously India is a very large country, many languages, and largely a rural population, and that's what we're trying to solve for. Uh, it's primarily a cash-based society, so most of the users that we interact with, these are not people uh, who have used credit and debit cards before. Uh, these are people who are making the shift, in fact, leapfrogging from cash-based uh, payments to mobile payments. Um, so these are mobile-first users who, who, who behave in a different way. Um, and um, and there's, however, there's a very large mobile user base. Uh, smartphone penetration is uh, still low compared to other developing countries, uh, but it's growing very rapidly and that presents an opportunity. On the merchant side, uh, we see that uh, there's a very unorganized and fragmented merchant landscape. And merchants are at least as important as you're trying to get a network going uh, as uh, customers are. Uh, so the focus on the merchant landscape and, and the innovation that you need to do there is quite important as well. And then finally, there's a limited card acceptance network with very large uh, barriers to adoption. So those are the types of things that we need to solve for. And if I could come to our business model and tech process, techs and tech processes product that we have used. Um, so in business model, one of the things that we started with, with is that we're going to be zero fees. So all Paytm transactions, Paytm to Paytm are zero fees. Uh, compared, uh, compared to card tr transactions where the card companies charge uh, about 2%, in some cases more. So the, so the conversation moves very quickly from why would I use digital payment to why would you not start accepting digital payments? And that's the type of behavior that we're trying to drive. Uh, then trying to develop use cases from the customer perspective. We're a very strong believer that if you want customers to adopt Payment, uh, payment platforms like ours, then they need to find uh, payment use cases in everything that they do. So the ubiquity of that presence is quite important, whether it's online merchants, offline merchants, recharge, utilities, P2P payments, we wanna cover all of it. And that also requires quite a lot of investment up front <clears throat> and a very large team uh, to bring all of these use cases. And ultimately what we wanna to get to is that customers can manage their whole life uh, on this app. The next point is branding. So if you're trying to create something which is a financial product, whether it's a payment product or financial services, and you're trying to create it for the masses, um, then offline marketing becomes very important, we found, because we are trying to uh, be relevant and, and reach users who have never used uh, online platforms before. So just relying on Google or Facebook or other uh, digital platforms advertising doesn't really work. Uh, so we have to go offline, and we have to go offline with a very simple brand message. Uh, and then the next point, we talked about trust earlier. Uh, customer care, we found, is actually a very important tool uh, to build trust. And 24 by 7 customer, uh, customer care, and just to, just to uh, focus uh, on making sure 
that that is going well. This is not ancillary to our business because ultimately what you're trying to do is create trust on your platform and actually uh, do repeat transactions with the customers. Uh, on the tech and processes and products, uh, there are some innovations that we can talk about here. Um, languages. Uh, in a country as diverse as in, in India, uh, we have moved beyond the first 100 million English users to the hundreds of millions of non-English users. So we have recently launched 10, 10 Indian language apps, and we already see more than 20% of our traffic is coming from these non-English users. Um, this, is, this is the language option on our app, uh, and that actually required quite a lot of work at the back end. Uh, the next point is just simple, uh, simple user interface. So customers who may not who may not have transacted before, they they respond to icons, they respond to very simple user experience, and this is quite important because the, the simpler that you want to make the front end, the more complexity that you need to solve for at the back end uh, to make sure that the transaction goes through seamlessly. And this is a pretty uh, pretty pretty large effort. The next is the core of our payment solution, which is QR code. Uh, scan and pay. We find that the customers love this because it's one click and most importantly customers um, enter the amount. This is not merchant entering the amount, uh, this customer entering the amount, which is very similar to the behavior that they would have in a cash payment environment, which is what they're used to. And as I said earlier, zero cost to the merchant. Uh, offline Salesforce, because these merchants actually need to be reached and also need to be educated. So we have a very large sales, uh, offline sales force which goes out and uh, onboards and educates merchants. And finally, as, as, as we talked about earlier, customer assurance. So in-app passbook, SMS notification, all of this innovation that we think about constantly, uh, which helps uh, drive adoption of our platform. Wow. Well, clearly, this is no way a uh, copy and paste from any other market, uh, Madhur. I think you really underline the importance of totally understanding your market uh, and how to create a value proposition that uh, is appropriate for rural first-time users for uh, a digital payment. So, obviously, the numbers and charges and things like that are a very specific to your, to your market, but the, the basic principle of understanding your clients and what's going on in their market is, is really uh, the complexity and the detail of it is a real challenge for all of us thinking about how to serve uh, clients who've been uh, excluded up until now. So, so thank you so much. I'm going to move on to, I'm sure lots of people have questions for it, so we'll, we'll come back to the questions at the end, Mador. I want to move on to guideline five now, because this is not quite so intuitive, but Ruan from Tigo chose to focus on this issue of interoperability as a priority for serving clients in his market. So, Ros, do you want to give us a super quick overview, and then I'll turn to Ruan. Yes, of course. So guideline five recognises the um, easy to say and hard to implement concept, the interoperability of pay platforms, agents and clients is highly desirable if clients are going to be able to make payments to each other even with different providers and if agents are to be able to work for different providers. However, the guideline does recognise that there needs to be a balance between, on the one hand, this desire for interoperability, and on the other hand, the desire for competition and innovation. So, Juan, can you tell us about what motivated Tigo to, to pursue interoperability in your market and what you've seen from uh, helping how clients have responded? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth. Uh, Tanzania made a strong case to pursue interoperability. Uh, we had three mobile operators that had a healthy mobile market share, and uh, we identified early on that this was a risk um, of creating multiple e-currencies that would not be, uh, you know, effectively or we would not be able to effectively compete with cash in an environment where you have these multiple currencies, which force customers to to go back to cash to interchange this e-value. So industry collaboration was essential to reduce this friction and to accelerate the network effect, um, and it helped to achieve the, the social and commercial potential that we believe mobile money had. Um, from the below graph that we, that we shared, uh, it's just an overview of kind of the transaction volume since we launched interoperability in, in August 2014. So
So to give you some of the highlights in, in, in 2014, uh, we, we brought on board two of the mobile operators um, and basically we could start seeing really good growth. And then in February last year, in 2016, we, we basically achieved full interoperability with all the major uh, mobile money providers in, in the market here. Um, and we started seeing obviously a much faster growth, but what really started showing acceleration for us was in July last year when we started doing an education campaign and, and obviously re-educating customers on, on mobile money. And this was critical to, to the success factors um, and to the adoption of, of mobile money. And we've st since seen a, a much uh, faster growth in, in the adoption of interoperable transactions within Tanzania. Um, and we expect by the end of this year, we'll, we'll achieve basically the same volumes on off-net or interoperable transactions that we are seeing on on-net transactions. Juan, I love that graph. All of us who work in finance love numbers, and it would be great to see the numbers, but the graph itself is very compelling uh, to show how by the work that you've done to interoperate between the different pro providers has actually served clients very well in that, in that market. Fascinating. But uh, tell me, what have been the barriers that you've experienced uh, in, in your market? Sure. Um, so I think what's obviously evident is that it took us a long time to get to full interoperability and a lot of work had actually happened before uh, August 2014 uh, when we launched with the first operators. And some of the key risks that were highlighted um, were obviously the fear of the unknown. And, and this is typically something that we see across most of our markets where, you know, we're not sure how it's going to impact the competitive landscape in our markets, uh, the existing investment that operators or stakeholders have made. You know, they feel that they might place this at risk uh, through interoperability and, and, you know, especially these are risks raised by the market leaders. Um, you know, so those are kind of a common risk that we've seen. Then we're talking about the commercials and, and commercially, it's, it's a really painful experience to try and get operators to agree uh, on, on a commercial model, but, you know, between these parties. And, and I really believe that these are some of the areas that we were able to work through in Tanzania over, over that first two years to help, uh, you know, achieve uh, interoperability. The other areas are, are, you know, which is also very common and, and, and typically raised in a lot of markets is platform readiness, um, you know, and scaling to interoperable transactions. Um, so these, again, I think it's very much uh, highlighted by the priorities of, of the mobile operators or, or the stakeholders in, you know, is, is interoperability a priority for them? And, uh, you know, do they really believe in it? Because you'll get the investment, you will drive a platform readiness if this is something that you believe in as, a, as, a, as an operator. So these are typical barriers and, and, and things that are raised. The last one, I think, um, you know, is something that was self-inflicted as, uh, you know, as an industry where we really spent a lot of time telling customers that sending a voucher or a token um, is, a, is an interoperable transaction. Now, for those that are familiar, that if you send a transaction previously before interoperability, you would receive an SMS and you would go to an agent and basically cash the funds out. So the value would not exchange electronically between the two wallets. Um, and this is basically what we sold customers as an interoperable or a, or a transaction, uh, uh, off-net transaction. So today a lot of work is going into re-educating customers that actually there's a different way of sending money across now and that it is interoperable uh, digitally from wallet to wallet. Yes, this is uh, obviously those legacy issues are very quite particular in the Tanzanian market, but every every market has has legacy issues in terms of uh, making progress. And so, what I'm uh, what I would assume then is that in deal you've dealt with all of these to be able to then uh, solve solve all these problems so that you could then serve your clients better, so that they could then reach their friends and family all over all over Tanzania. But particularly when it comes to uh, taking the risk for the uh, company and for the client out of interoperability. Can you just talk quickly, uh, quickly about that? Sure. Yeah, I think what was important was obviously to build something that would be successful and, and would, uh, uh, you know, make sure that this is a sustainable business model. Uh, you know, one of the things that we, that we realized in Tanzania, we were quite fortunate is that we had a, a regulator that was very, uh, you know, created an environment that was very positive for us and, and allowed the industry to kind of lead the discussion. And I think this is where regulators across, uh, you know, uh, the continent and, and globally have a, a very important role to play is to engender uh, 
that environment of for interoperability. Um, you know, instead of mandating or forcing this down, you know, it becomes really difficult. And some of those barriers that I mentioned in the previous slide, you know, become much more evident when it's something that's mandated, because it's really difficult for operators to work through some of those challenges and, and you know, and even banks in, in where we're talking about interoperability. Um, so the model in Tanzania was very much industry-led and, and it had a lot of discussion for, for almost a year where the industry met on a frequent basis and this was facilitated by the IFC and GSMA um, and helped us work through some of those barriers that we discussed. Um, one of the other things that I believe helped in Tanzania was that we went with a bilateral agreement. Um, so instead of going for a switch or putting a technology in the middle between all these partners, it, it was to, to kind of agree on a bilateral terms and this allowed us to to move a little bit faster, instead of trying to get everyone on board at the same time, we could work with willing partners at that at the early on. Um, so we were able to to sign bilateral agreements, and and I think when you're talking to operators and, and banks, it really works well because there's existing relationship between most of those entities and, and and within the industry. So we already have existing commercial agreements on interconnection, and we have relationship with banks where we have bank accounts. So being able to move into bilateral agreements on some of these things are, are much easier. Um, and then I think on the de-risking de side on interoperability, uh, you, know, it, it, you know, obviously it was important to establish early on risk forums and, and very strong uh, relationships between the different entities to ensure that we mitigate any risk. It was important to provide transparency to our customers and, and create uh, customer satisfaction. So having SLAs in place was critical. Um, we also needed to understand we were going to lose the end-to-end -end visibility on a transaction. So we became more reliant on, on uh, our partners, our interoperable partners, to be able to detect fraud and mitigate any arbitrage opportunities. So these are some of the kind of early on things that we discussed. Um, obviously, the big ticket item was the pricing and the commercials, like I mentioned. And what we managed to deliver in, in Tanzania was a, uh, an equitable pricing structure where um, there was firstly no discrimination on the on-net and off-net transactions, so a customer paid the same price whether they send the customer to their own network or to another network. And then also we, were, we basically have an equitable share on revenue, so there's no opportunity for an operator or a stakeholder to uh, try and uh, influence the flow of transactions to be a net receiver or a net sender because you make the same uh, return on sending or receiving funds to any operators. So these are some of the critical things that, that I believe help drive the industry and build a successful uh, mobile money um, kind of model and ecosystem for us. Yes, the importance of building all the different factors to, to, for an ecosystem that works for the clients. What, listening to you, it really brought home the, this is not a, a, one of the guidelines sitting on its own. It's very closely related to the product transparency guideline, the guideline about uh, designing for clients' needs and capabilities, and uh, also, of course, number six, the next one, which is taking responsibility for providers of client services across the value chain. So it's interesting how you've incorporated all those different uh, guidelines in, in your comments. Um, Rose, would you just give us a quick overview of guideline six? Absolutely. Um, and it's certainly true to say that all these guidelines are interconnected. Guideline 6 addresses the fundamental point, again, that clients are more likely to trust and use digital payments if providers take responsibility for everyone in their value chain that's interacting with the clients. How do you do this? The clear and obvious way is accepting liability for the actions of, in particular, agents and employees and even service providers training them on products, and by this I mean product terms, product features, the price of products, and of course any risks of the products. Also training your agents and employees on regulatory requirements, for example, know your customer requirements. And this may sound obvious, but it's very important. Making sure that clients know the name and contact details of the provider. So who to go to if they have a, a question, if they have a complaint, if they have a concern, an unauthorised transaction, anything like that. It was fascinating. I was talking to uh, Tencent in China during the G20 meetings last year. And for them, this was uh, uh, an aha moment for uh, in their own decision making. They realised that unless they took responsibility 
right across the value chain, they couldn't guarantee serving their uh, customers well. And so they were sharing with uh, at the meetings that this was key to providing excellent service for customers wherever they were in China. And I think their growth and the satisfaction of their customers has, uh, has been um, testament to the importance of this, uh, this guideline. Although it's not easy, you know, it's easy to say, but they said it was uh, challenging to actually offer take that responsibility all the way through. So, um, Ros, guideline seven on protecting client data is a very hot topic at the moment. So, can you give us an overview and then we'll talk a bit about it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, let me just go backwards for a moment. In guideline five, designing for client needs, um, I think I mentioned that one of the obvious ways of doing this is collecting a lot of data about your clients and how they use mobile services or may wish to use mobile services, all sorts of you know, behavioural and demographic data. However, this raises data protection issues and Guideline 7 um, recognises that the security and confidentiality of client data is increasingly important in a digital environment. So this is sort of the big data issue that I mentioned. Um, Guideline 7 also notes the need for an audit trail so clients can track transactions. I mean, that's another data-related point that's highlighted in the guideline. Yeah, there's uh, a lot to be said here. And just so that people know, the Responsible Finance Forum that's being hosted by Germany this year at the very end of April is addressing this topic. There's a whole conference just on uh, protecting client data and the security issues. Can you just say a, a few words about um, ID fraud and uh, and hacking ID, Rod? Sure, sure. I mean, you've got the, you've got risks of identity fraud. Um, you get consequential reputational damage if your data is collected, used, and disclosed without your knowledge, without checking its accuracy for all sorts of different purposes. Um, and of course, there's a risk of payments loss of financial loss if payment accounts are hacked from insecure systems. Um, there's been quite a lot of research done on this issue. The University of Florida has published some very well-known research. They looked at 46 Android mobile money apps in developing countries and showed that over half of them did not properly encrypt their communications, making them exposed to hacking. And on the identity fraud issue, I mean, taking Australia, which may seem like an unusual example, um, I came across these statistics. In 2015, there were 770,000 Australians who were victims of identity theft, and they lost an average of over US $3,000 each. So that's, you know, in a country like Australia. So these are real live issues that, um, yeah, as Ruth, you were saying, very, very hot topic indeed. And th this also relates closely to guideline two, which is about keeping client funds safe. And that's why SBS has got its uh, a very, very um, careful uh, process to make sure that the providers of e-money uh, do keep their client funds safe. And obviously, we can, we'll come back to uh, Madora and Ruan maybe to, to talk about this during the, the question time. I think it's probably good to get to uh, guideline eight, so we've got all of our eight ones wrapped up. Um, okay, so guideline eight, our last one. Um, it recognises the, fund again, another fundamental point, I think, that clients need a fair, well-publicised, accessible recourse system, somewhere they can go if they've got a problem with a product and how it operates in practice. And obviously this is particularly important when you're talking about innovative, unfamiliar digital products, you're talking about clients living in remote areas. And there's two angles to this. One of them is the guideline recognises the need for the provider to have their own complaint resolution system and that there should also be an external dispute resolution system, such as a financial ombudsman. Um, and a further point made in the guideline, as an example, of effective recourse is providing data on complaints to the regulator so they can identify systemic risks and concerns. Well, and talking about the regulator, I think that's the, the cue for, for, yeah. uh, for Elias to, uh, to join us. Elias, you have uh, 
taken great uh, seriousness about this recourse. Could you share with us an example of uh, how you've addressed uh, recourse opportunities for clients in Peru? Of course, Ruth. The SBS has established uh, a set of regulatory provisions regarding customer service and complaint resolution processes, which are uh, applicable to e every financial institution, including specialized e-money firms as, as, I, I, as I talked uh, previously. These companies must adopt formal policies and procedures in these matters, and also uh, they, 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 they have to designate a particular department st or staff to be responsible not only for handling customer complaints, but also for internal monitoring and improving action. In addition, uh, the SBS has established minimum standards for internal complaint resolution procedures, which are, uh, which are described in our norms. For example, it is mandatory that complaint systems are easily accessible and free from the client perspective. Available channels and procedures for s submitting a complaint must be disclosed by the company, and also all complaints Complaints must be recorded and resolved within a 30-day period. In addition to the user orientation platform established by the SBS, which provides an external complaint handling mechanism, there is another, uh, another regulator, a separate National Consumer Protection Authority, which is called in the copy, which is in charge of providing dispute resolution and redress mechanism for the clients. Well, clearly, you paid. Uh, yes, you've clearly paid very careful attention to to recourse mechanisms so that they are easily accessible and free for our clients, so that they can trust that their uh, any problems that they have will be will be solved within a, a time in a timely manner. So, thank you, uh, thank you, Elias. All of the guidelines. The summary is now um, in front of you. This is obviously just uh, the summary version because there's lots of detail behind all of them. And the examples that we've heard from India and Tanzania and Peru are just examples of how uh, our panelists have addressed them. We could have had really different panelists and really different answers, but the, the principles or the guidelines are the same. I'd just like you to take a moment now and think we're going to do a quick poll to see which ones are you want to work on first, for those of you who are thinking about these? Uh, oops, I think there's going to be a poll coming up um, that will give you options. Of, there's just five. Uh, the Keeping Clients Fun Safe, Guideline 2. The Designing for Client Needs and Capability 4. Protecting Client Data and Providing Client Recourse 7 and 8, or all of them. So we're just interested to know uh, what is uh, what you are going to be working on first or what you are already working on, um, just because that will also help us as we just wrap up with, with the questions. So I know that there's lots of questions being coming in and we're looking forward to doing that. So if you just finish up clicking and uh, then we will see the result come up. Thank you. Ah, isn't that interesting? Designing for client needs and capabilities and all of them are the clear winners. So that is uh, fantastic. I mean, obviously they're all related as we said, but uh, it's really uh, fantastic to know how important client needs and capability is and uh, all of them working together. So uh, thank, you for, thank you for that feedback. So moving to the Q&A session, Madur, there's a question that's come in for you uh, as CFO. Uh, you have to convince your board members that the company should invest in these client protection measures. So how do you convince your board that this is uh, a worthwhile investment? To be honest, it's uh, not that difficult. Um, I think fundamentally, as financial services companies, we're not chasing single transactions with customers. We are chasing long-term relationships. Uh, and that's something that the management and the board uh, and the shareholders need to be clear about. If that is the case, then it becomes very easy, actually. Uh, because when, when you take a step back, um, 
I'd like to point out that the customer already knows the evade guidelines at the back of their mind. What I mean by that is that the customer values these things, and these are the things that are fundamental to what will create a relationship with that customer as opposed to one-off transactions. And if you fail on one or more of these guidelines, then your business will fail. Um, you know, customer may not be able to articulate it in quite the same way uh, as, as, as we have on this call, but they expect these things. So if you want to build a sustainable business, these are necessary investments. This is not money wasted. And as long as your board is aligned uh, to that vision uh, and the board and the management, the shareholder team uh, is aligned uh, to that vision, then um, we don't think that these are really challenges to implement. I will make one caveat on the interoperability discussion. Uh, while I don't necessarily disagree with what was said earlier, uh, in, in, we do find that for uh, networks like us, it is more of a strategic call, and there are a number of nuances about what you do and when you do it to make sure that the network uh, is, is working for all the participants and stakeholders. Uh, but with, with that one caveat, what I would say is that these guidelines are fundamental to building uh, a long-term business. That is music to my ears, Madura. And you weren't involved in setting up these guidelines, but uh, as uh, Roz had explained, they were very uh, carefully consulted. And so the fact that in your experience that customers may not be able to articulate that this is what is important to, to them, especially people who have been not been part of the financial system up until now. And so being able to serve them well by using these guidelines is uh, just terrific to hear that you're saying there's not a, that you're, from a perspective of a business, this is just simply good business. And so uh, that's uh, terrific. A question has come in about women clients. Designing uh, for client needs and capabilities was uh, an important priority for many of the people on the call. So, Ruan, could I just ask you, you were focusing on the technical side, but you said it was also important for the social side, of the work that you were doing in Tigo. So, are there any particular concerns or actions that uh, you have taken or think should be taken when it comes to serving women in your market? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I think we've, we've, we have, especially over the last 12 to 18 months, uh, had a very specific focus on, on how we do we drive adoption amongst women. And we've obviously looked at specific use cases uh, that um, are, you know, especially in rural communities and the types of economic activity of the women in, in, in areas that we are uh, trying to reach. Um, so we've built a number of use cases. I mean, we're looking at obviously in the savings areas, but also a lot of the trading and informal trading that's happening. So when we're starting to, to build around payments and, and uh, education around payments and, and using a mobile money as a form or mechanism of payments, these are critical or key areas to focus. So a lot of what we're doing at the moment is, is uh, trying to understand from the data that we have is uh, the adoption. And, and we've seen a lot of insights come out uh, end of last year. Uh, around uh, the age groups and, uh, and gender. And typically the adoption rate is much higher between the ages of, uh, and this is between male and then, uh, women as well, female, uh, between the ages of 20 and 30. Um, there's a much obviously higher levels of education and, and more economic activity starting to happen at that age. So we've seen a higher levels of adoption also in the female population. And actually interesting enough, the split between urban and rural adoption is, is also very similar uh, in that regard. Thank you. Uh, another question has come in for Madhur again uh, on security relating to uh, how to prevent fraud so poor people are not victims of scams. Would you like to take that one, Madhur? Can you hear me? I think you're on mute. Okay, we will go to a question for the regulator. So, uh, Elias, just quickly before we wrap up, can you give us uh, an example of how, as a regulator, you can uh, you are facilitating reaching everybody, whether it's interoperability or others, to really driving uh, including everybody in the uh, financial system? Yeah, thank you. 
uh, that was uh, also something that we discussed early uh, when we were developing the regulation. And what what we get there in, in that moment was that uh, the regulation uh, has not, impo not, not don't impo doesn't impose any obligation for interoperability among uh, among the platforms that can be developed in the industry. And the, but the, on, the only way that the regulation tried to, to, to close each platform is by the, a, a provision that establishes that SBS in the future maybe can impose some uh, requirements related to this matter. But not right now, because we, we, uh, we did, didn't uh, want to, to close the market in this early stage and that's the way that we focus this matter. Great. Uh, it's really good to hear a range of different perspectives on that. Uh, thank you, Elias. Well, to uh, wrap up in the last couple of minutes then, I want to let you know that the responsible digital payment guidelines are available in English and French and Spanish on our website, and we'll be sharing the recording uh, on our website uh, as soon as uh, very soon after this is over. We really hope that this will help drive implementation of these guidelines. Obviously, it's good business, but most importantly for us, this is about clients, that they are safe and happy to use uh, digital payments, that this will have to be worked out in each market, but that all of these together make a very compelling a set of guidelines for providers and for governments and for uh, international organizations working across it. So, Beth, since we have one minute, I'd just like you to say how you want people to, to implement these. Yeah, I should just say, Beth was our team member working behind the scenes for all of this uh, webinar and on the guidelines. Beth. Thank, thank you, Ruth. Um, yes, um, what is most important um, is that the responsible digital payment guidelines don't stay in a book or a webinar, but they are put into action. So if you're a payment provider like Paytm or Tigo or a financial supervisor like DSBS, the action steps are clear from our discussion today. If you come from government or a development organization, you can use them in your procurement processes for payment services. For example, you can put them in your um, requirements for contracting service providers and then tell us about it as we're looking for good case studies to write up. If you're a donor or investor, you can use them in your due diligence or assessment processes for your grant or investment agreements relating to payment services. You heard that customers know these guidelines already and that they're necessary from their point of view, so why not? We'll be writing up case studies to illustrate how the guidelines have been put into practice. So we want to hear from you about how you're using them and how they have made a difference to you in managing risk. Please check our website for information on how to share your ideas and experiences with us. Thanks, Beth. So we're going to be writing cases. So if you want to share your examples, then uh, please do. Uh, the, on your webinar invitation, there was an email address of Angela. You're welcome to email her or uh, through the Better Than Cash website. We would be delighted to hear from you. And given the huge interest in this topic and the fact that we're only just able to touch on these guidelines, it looks like there's going to be demand for doing more of this. So thank you so much to our panelists, Madur, Ruan, Roz, and Elias. We really appreciate your time today and for sharing your insights. And thank you to everyone joining us around the world, whatever time of day it is. Thank you and goodbye.